Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this side event that is titled Action Towards Marine Plastic Pollution for Implementation of SDG 14. My name is Lydia Ngugi, head of MTCC Africa, that is the Maritime Technology Cooperation Center for Africa. I will be your moderator for this session. We now start off with the keynote addresses, and I now welcome Mrs. Nancy Karigidu, who is the Principal Secretary for Shipping and Maritime Affairs and the Ambassador and Special Envoy of Maritime and Blue Economy in Kenya. Welcome, Madam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lydia. And thank you, everybody who's come here today, distinguished participants, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to this side event, which is being organized in order to lay emphasis on the significance of marine pollution control towards the attainment of SDG 14. Thank you very much for joining us. The overarching statement that has been repeated throughout this two-day meeting from yesterday is that the ocean is life. We don't doubt that. Over three billion of us depend on marine and coastal biodiversity for our livelihoods, including the other ecosystem services. But despite its crucial role, our ocean is increasingly threatened, degraded, or destroyed by our own human activities, reducing the ocean's ability, therefore, to provide crucial support to our ecosystems. Marine or sea-based litter has been recognized as one of the single biggest threats to ocean health, and of particular concern in this regard is plastic litter, which in its form and substance persists in marine environment for prolonged periods of time. Plastic is by far the most prevalent debris item recorded, contributing to an estimated 60 to 80% of all marine debris, including discarded fishing gear, also known as ghost fishing gear, that could account for up to 10% of marine debris. Yet, without urgent action, plastic production is likely to double by 2040, and plastic pollution could triple by 2040 if no action is taken. Most significant, the plastic pollution crisis jeopardizes the achievement of United Nations Sustainable Goal Number 14, by which we all committed to prevent and reduce marine pollution and conserve and use the oceans sustainably. Addressing marine plastic pollution therefore becomes an urgent action, considering the rising levels of plastic in the environment and the impact to coastal and marine ecosystem. It is clear that efforts to reduce the quantities of litter that reach the marine environment from both land and sea-based sources will demand a wide array of actions and approaches. But as we are putting efforts to address this menace, we are confronted with various gaps which hamper our actions in tackling the problem. Urgent action is needed to cure these existing gaps, and I will go through a few of them. The first one being gaps in policy and regulatory frameworks to tackle marine plastic litter, particularly coordinated policy frameworks, agreements, action plans also needed to support implementation of upstream solutions synchronized with downstream plastic management. Most commitments for tackling plastic pollution have so far followed a voluntary approach. And it's also project-based. Urgent action is therefore required, and developing an international legally binding instrument on plastic pollution at this moment in time seems to be one of the single most important actions that can give impetus towards a quick solution to this problem. We have gaps also in knowledge, data, and information which we need to urgently look into, especially in areas such as marine litter inventory and flows of macro and microplastics in the oceans. The environmental and social economic impacts of marine plastics, human behavior, and cultural drivers of plastics consumptions, and tools to assess innovative sector-relevant solutions for addressing the problem are also needed. We need research in technology and innovation across the plastics value chain, 
In order to address such areas as product designs, maybe we could produce, we could target producing higher grade plastic products which have lower impacts in use and end life phases as well as improved technologies that could allow reuse and recyclability of materials. Also, innovation in areas of affordable and sustainable alternative consumers may tap into this issue, thus enabling them a swift and smooth shift away from single-use plastic products. We also see major, major gaps in coordinated financing and incentives that could support upstream solutions to plastic pollution and to prevent the leakage of plastics into the environment, including financing of innovative product designs and business model, as well as integrated management systems. To close these gaps, ladies and gentlemen, we must have cross-cutting actions so as to deliver the conditions that will enable and implement for us a circular economy, and also cover aspects of knowledge, policy, financing, and coordination. Action on knowledge, data, and information may entail establishing methodologies to allow for harmonized assessment on plastic material flows, leakage and impacts of marine litter and microplastics, as well as undertaking country baselines and tracking progress. In the meantime, and in the short term, we need and must initiate policy reforms and financial mechanisms in order to focus on the reduction of the amount of plastic waste we generate, the promotion for reuse, and increasing the demand for recycled content. content. Developing waste management policies, such as extended producer responsibility, and supporting their implementation to encourage design for reuse and recycling, while taking care of end-of-life products, are also other measures. Exchange on best practices, capacity building, peer learning and cooperation must happen across the divide in the regional and global stage in order to foster global coordination and ensure that no one is left behind in tackling the problem. Action on material engineering and product designs with increased research and funding will also help. Brands and industry, this is the private sector now, must also upscale innovative business model in order to shift from single use. And most important is the action to trigger behavioral change. That's going straight down to the stakeholders. Because among consumers, there is also possibility for solutions through targeted campaigns and awareness creation so that everyone may better understand also that littering and reuse, recycling are also solutions. Avoiding of littering, sorry. Industry must provide clear and reliable sustainability information based on the life cycle of the material and also labeling standards Actions on proper management of municipal wastes is also possible. And we also have systems to improve at source collection and segregation of wastes. We must have promotion of waste management schemes and also financing, sorry, producer responsibility that could drive industry involvement and sustainable financing in order to treat these products at end life better. Furthermore, encouraging Management of wastes that generate wealth to local community. communities can also help. Ladies and gentlemen, those are just a few thought-provoking ideas. We have our work cut out for us, and it is therefore my wish that the discussions in this forum today will trigger even more innovative solutions to the plastic problem and also generate more commitments towards collective efforts into tackling this menace. I wish you fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Principal Secretary. We have taken note that there is need to have innovative business models to promote a circular economy for sustainable development. Thank you very much for that highlight. I now take this opportunity to welcome Mr. Gustavo Miranda, Minister of Environment, Water, and Ecological Transition from the Republic of Ecuador to give us his keynote speech. Welcome, sir.
Good afternoon to everyone. Hope you have been enjoying and having good contacts and meeting during these uh, couple days. Um, I want to share with you some thoughts from our perspective. Uh, I'm from Ecuador. I'm the Minister of Environment, Water, and Ecological Transition. I've been involved in the private sector for several years, advising, among other terms, uh, to create ordinance in municipalities uh, for single-use plastic. And now I'm uh, part of the government. Um, our planet, planet is going through a crisis. The effect of climate change, biodiversity, loss, and pollution are visible and undeniable. Every day we're witnesses to the consequence that this triple crisis has on the environment, society, and the rights of people. As one of the 17 countries with the greatest biodiversity in the world, Ecuador is committed to protecting the environment and preserving nature. We are the first country in Latin America and the fourth in the world to have adopted a cross-cutting policy of ecological transition, which includes a mainstreaming of the protection of nature to all the nations, entities, and also to all the actors in our country, with one objective, to achieve a singular, resilient, and low emission economy. This objective of our ecological transition will not be possible if we don't address the global threat on plastic pollution and its negative impacts on the environment, health, tourism, trade, and to the full enjoyment of human rights as well as the rights of nature, of course. However, we cannot do it alone. Global solutions require global actions, and certainly a strong multilateralism for conservation and solution to environmental problems. In this regard, we are pleased to have played a key role at UNEA 5 in Nairobi, and even before, in the adoption of resolution 514, which established the mandate for the negotiation of an international legally binding instrument to address all types of plastic pollution to a whole life circle approach. In fact, Ecuador was the first country that formally mentioned the Basel Convention COP that the need for an international legally binding instrument to combat plastic pollution. Some years later, in September 2021, we co-organized together with Germany, Ghana, and Vietnam a ministerial conference that ended with a declaration supported by more than 75 countries providing a key political push for the successful outcome of UNIA. Likewise, at the World Trade Organization, our country coordinates together with Australia, Barbados, Fiji, Morocco, and China, China the informal dialogue of plastic pollution and environmental sustainable trade. Also, a recognition that to achieve the plastic pollution free planet, we need the participation of all relevant stakeholders. Internally, Ecuador has also taken a firm position against plastic pollution, and for that, we have adopted important measures that different levels of government to promote a comprehensive treatment and cross-sectoral approach to plastic throughout their life cycles. I want to share with you three concrete examples of what Ecuador is doing in different levels in order to combat plastic pollution. In Ecuador, we have the organic law for the rationalization, reuse, and reduction of single-use pl plastic with the objective of regulating the generation of plastic waste and progressively reducing its use through the sustainable production and consumption. As well, we also have the organic law of inclusive circular economy, which promotes propose mechanisms for the transition for the lineal economy to the inclusive circular economy enter into force. And also we have the redeemable tax. And I want to stop here and, and break a little bit the protocol. 
and share with you the practical way we use the redeemable tax. We are not a producer of resina, plastic resina. We import around $400 million of resign, plastic resign. The importer of the plastic resign in a scroll account of the IRS deposit two cents per bottle. When the importer of the resign sells the resign to the factory that creates the bottle, they sell the raw material, the resign, and they recover the two cents. This factory that creates the bottle and sells it to the bottle company recovers the raw material, the production of the bottle, and the two cents that they pay. The retailer, as well, when they buy the bottle with the liquid, they pay all the chain plus the two cents. And when it's in the market, the consumer pays the product with a profit, drinks the bottle, the, the liquid, and has the bottle that it's worth two cents. And they can go to a specific place and recover the two cents. And this picker has to give a paper to the consumer and keeps the bottle. And with the paper, they go to the IRS and recover the two cents. Nobody paid. And it's a $50 million business that now it's in the base of the pyramid. And we became one of the most efficient countries in the world to recycle plastic bottle. So it's a very efficient way, a policy that creates a market that before of that, they were going to the landfill. So I always, when I'm a, in an audience like this one, I share this experience because I think from the perspective of Ecuador, it creates a market that no one's pay, that the money go to the base of the pyramid, to the pickers, that 70% of, of them are women. At the same time, we want this law to be fully implemented by all. And this is why we have adopted the redeemable tax of bottle that I just mentioned. And I just want to add that these people, only 8% of them has finished school. So they are really poor people. And I encourage you to, or dare you, that when you visit Ecuador, try to find a plastic bottle in the street. You will find it. There are 18 million Ecuadorians picking bottles because there is a cost on it. And 75% of them, of, the, of, of those 50,000 person speakers, 75% of them are women, single, most of them. I welcome you again to this event, and I look forward for your participation and to engage in the conversation of the future of the 3D on plastic pollution. Thanks once again for the invitation. Thank you, Honorable Minister, for that um, keynote address. We have definitely taken note that global solutions require global actions. And we are pleased to note that the Republic of Ecuador played a key role in Nairobi on the need to have a legally binding instrument for all member states in need to protect the environment. Thank you very much. I now take this opportunity to welcome Dr. Mr. Jose Matheikal, who is the Chief Department of Partnerships and Projects from the International Maritime Organization, to give his keynote address. Welcome, sir. Good afternoon, Minister, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Minister, for inspiring us with that excellent example from Ecuador. Um, it's a pleasure uh, for me to join you today uh, on behalf of IMO, um, and I bring the greetings of the IMO Secretary General, Mr. Kitak Lim, who unfortunately was not able to be here due to other commitments. And thank you to our other co-organizers for the very timely event in Stockholm 50 plus on this plastic issue. As part of the UN family, IMO is actively working towards the 2030 
agenda for SDGs and other associated SDGs. Indeed, most of the elements of the 2030 agenda will only be realized with a sustainable transport sector supporting the world trade and facilitating global economy. If you look anywhere in the room, you would see that we couldn't see any item without being connected to shipping in one way or other. International shipping is one of the biggest users of the world oceans too. In fact, most activities taking place on the ocean involves ships to one extent or other. IMO as a UN specialized agency in shipping is responsible for measures to improve the safety and security of international shipping and to prevent pollution from ships, but also matters to prevent marine pollution from dumping of waste at sea. IMO's work is integral to SDG 14 and to the governance of oceans. The work of IMO therefore relates to most, if not all, of the SDG 14 targets, particularly as regards its environmental conventions. Implementing and enforcing the regulatory framework adopted by IMO member states actively addresses marine pollution, mainly that from the sea-based sources, but also, at least indirectly, from the land-based so sources, for example, through the London Convention and Protocol on Dumping Waste and Other Matter at Sea. On the issue of marine plastic litter, IMO has been leading the efforts for decades. MARPOL Annex 5 banned the discharge of waste containing plastic already in the 1980s and the London Convention Protocol has regulated the matter since the 70s. However, noting the need to strengthen the efforts to implement these regulations, in 2018, IMO's Marine Environment Protection Committee, MEPC, adopted the IMO Action Plan to address marine plastic litter from ships, which aims to enhance implementation of the existing IMO regulations and identify opportunities to enhance these to address the issue of marine plastic from ships. Taking its departure from the IMO action plan and noting the need to strengthen the cross-sectoral work in marine plastic litter, IMO and the FAO joined efforts in 2019 as the executing organization of the Glow Litter Partnerships Project to work with global, regional, and country-level partners to enhance the implementation of MARPO Annex 5 the London Protocol, and the FAO voluntary guidelines for marking of fishing gear globally. With the support from the Norwegian government, I'm very glad to see NORAD being here. Thanks to NORAD for the very big support, as well as additional financial contribution that now came in from Australia and from Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the Glowliter now supports 30 project developed partner countries from five regions with capacity building activities advisory services on legal and regulatory issues, and demonstration projects tackling marine plastic litter. Glowliter supports its partnering countries to develop national work plans on sea-based marine plastic litter tailored to the needs of the each country, provides the necessary technical assistance and training to implement those plans and facilitate a regional cooperation. This project also facilitates the establishment of a private-public partnership and we, we call it the Global Industry Alliance to spur the development of cost-effective management solutions for marine plastic litter, including examining how to decrease the use of plastic in these industries and looking at opportunities to reuse and recycle plastic. And we, we partner with the UN Global Compact to implement this Global Industry Alliance on marine plastic litter. Our common objective is to help the maritime transport and the fishing sectors move towards a low plastic future. I strongly believe that our global partnership like we are seeing, witnessing today at this event is critical to, for our success in addressing this global program, problem on marine plastic litter from the sea-based sources. I would like to thank the organizers of this event, the Government of Kenya, um, um, thank you Madam Nancy, um, Government of Ecuador, thank you Minister, Food FAO and the WWF, uh, and my special appreciation to Ambassador, uh, Ms. Nancy Kirigutu, uh, Principal Secretary of Shipping and Maritime Affairs, and Special Envoy for Maritime and Blue Economy from Kenya for her leadership, commitment, and Kenya's active participation in this particular project as a lead partner country from the region. And uh, also, thank you to NORAD for this fantastic uh, support that came through. 
Um, of course, other donors are starting to come in. We're seeing the importance of this issue, and we may see more coming in this year sometimes. So, and also thank you, Lydia from MDC Africa for, for moderating this. I wish you a very successful event and a very good discussion in the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Matheko, for that highlight, noting that the International Maritime Organization looks into MAPOL and X5, and through the MAPC, looking at the action point for marine plastic litter from ships. This is highly appreciated. We now move to the interactive panel session, where we shall be having the panelists come to the stage and give us some of their key highlights and notable comments. However, we will start with the representative from the Food Agricultural Organization who is joining us virtually. I welcome Madam Maria Amparo Perez Roda, who is the fishery officer from the Food Agricultural Organization. I see she is connected. Can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear, Lydia. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I will call the other panelists to the stage. I will start with Madam Nancy Karigidhu, who is the Principal Secretary for Shipping and Maritime Affairs in the, in the Republic of Kenya. She is as well the Ambassador and Special Envoy on Maritime and Blue Economy in Kenya. I now again welcome Mr. Gustavo Miranda, who is the Minister of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition from the Republic of Ecuador. Welcome. Thank you. A round of applause for him. I as well me welcome Mr. Frederick Hugg, who is the head of Office for London Convention, Protocol and Ocean Affairs from the International Maritime Organization, London. Welcome. I as well welcome Mr. Gustav Lind, who is the CEO of the World Wide Fund for Nature, Sweden office. Welcome. And last but not least, I welcome Mr. Stig Travik, who is the Director, Department for Climate and Environment under the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD. Welcome. As you can see, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very eminent panel on the podium. We are definitely looking forward to hear from them. I will give each panelist a minute or two to give us their highlight towards this session before we start with the questions. I will welcome Madam Maria from FAO for her comments. Welcome. Thank you, Lydia. I will uh, start to, uh, by, uh, to apologize for not being there in person, but my colleagues, there is an FAO delegation there participating in Estacom 50 plus. Uh, so I am here today to join this uh, important side event to bring uh, the fisheries sector, the importance of including the fisheries sector as well in the, in the discussions to address marine plastic litter from sea-based sources. And I'm very happy to be here together with the rest of the panelists, which some of them are uh, Almost all of them are partners to the Glow Leader Partnership uh, project. So I think we can we can have good discussions to uh, to show practical examples of how to cooperate to address uh, this issue from different sectors and also from different uh, at different uh, geographical scales. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I now give the next commentary to Mr. Stig Travik, from Mr. Stig Travik, who is the director from NORAD. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much. I'm very happy uh, to be uh, here. I think we, we heard clearly already that collaboration towards a stronger international set of uh, rules and international agreement on plastic litter is extremely uh, important. Um, in the meantime, I think stronger collaboration and stronger partnerships to minimize the use of uh, plastics, and especially non-recyclable plastics, 
is extremely important. I think the minister from Ecuador pointed out very clearly about what can be done if you're clever about how you incentivize uh, recycling. I think in, in general also to look at also the informal sector, how you can work with the informal sector, create jobs and create healthier jobs in recycling plastics and in waste management in general. It's a very important topic that we should talk more about. Thank you very much. I welcome Mr. Gustav Lind for his comments. Well, I will say my role here is get, perhaps I am the NGO representative. So you see, I'm the brown suit with the gray and blue suits uh, <laughs> here. And my job is sort of to work with you guys to keep your motivation up. And if you don't, I am the watchdog and the entire campaign uh, and will give you a hard time. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure they've what taken note of that advice. WWF. Oh, WWF. I welcome Mr. Frederick. <laughs> thank you, and thank you, everyone who spoke before. And I, I think that from, from my end, I'd like to uh, perhaps uh, stress the fact that um, IMO, as we heard, has uh, its, it, its um, regulation that covers a specific sector. But what we have learned, I think in particular over the last decade maybe, is that um, the capacity to implement the regulations we have differs greatly around the world. And the only way to actually really address them is to not think in a silo, but reach out and work across the sectors, which is what we're doing in the Glolita project we heard a bit about before, and which I may actually raise again a bit later, and probably on par as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Frederick. And now we move to Honorable Minister. Welcome, sir from Republic of Ecuador. Um, ju I just, I think we're going to the questions later on, right? Yes. Okay, just to be sure. Um, I think that, that the biggest challenge we have here is to um, be come out with something that could be implemented in a very rich country as well as a very poor country. Everybody says technology. But I'm thinking in our case, for example, uh, we visit our crew this week and neighborhood that it's fully automati automaticized, the picking of the waste with, with some pumping and tubes that go to another place. If we implement that, we live on street 15,000 people with no jobs if we implement full technology in picking. So just to have that on mind that uh, the challenge is to find technologies or policies that could be applied depending on the economy or the geographical position we are. Thank you, Honorable Minister. We've definitely noted the need to have the link between technology and policy. Thank you. I now welcome Principal Secretary Madam Nancy for her comment. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, I think I want to say that uh, having a uniform way of dealing with plastic, having an overarching uh, approach instead of uh, voluntary, the way we've been doing it. I know like in Kenya, we just did a guillotine approach and banned overnight single plastic use. But having uh, an international convention or a framework that we could all ascribe to that could guide public uh, actions and also incentivize maybe the private sector, I think that would really, really assist instead of this volunt voluntary project-based uh, actions. We've had the case of Ecuador, which is very commendable, the way you're dealing with it. but. How long will it take us if we do not have that intervention that encourages a lot more of us uh, to take that action? That's what lingers in my mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that strategic intervention as well. We now move to the panel questions, and we shall start with Madam Maria, who is joining us, I'll bet, virtually. And I note that she had highlighted that she can see on the, on the program list relevant stakeholders who have been participating and partnering with her organization. And to you, Madam Maria, 
what are the main objectives of the International Maritime Organization and the FAO Glow Little Partnerships Projects? Welcome. Thank you, Lydia, for the question. Uh, so our project aims to support developing countries in addressing marine plastic litter from the fisheries sector, and in particular from the shipping and the fisheries sector. And we aim to do this through creating partnerships. That's why the title of our project. That means that we aim to bring together, uh, at this moment we have uh, in total 30 countries. So 30 developing countries that will be working together to implement uh, legal, regulatory, and national reforms to address the issue from both sectors. And we also, as uh, Mr. Matejkal mentioned, we also bring the private sector in through the Global Industry Alliance. So they will be also engaged in finding solutions to the problem. And another thing I wanted to highlight is that the, the project focuses on, uh, at national level, the actions focuses on the legal policy and, regula and rec regulatory reforms that will be based on the existing international instruments, so which are IMO, um, MARPOL Annex 5, the London Convention, London Protocol, and from FAO side, we have the voluntary guidelines on the marking of fishing gear, which is the, uh, the, the only current international instrument that deals with uh, abandoned, lost, and discarded fishing gear, which, as you know, is one of the main sources, the most, of the, uh, the most harmful sources of marine plastic litter coming from the fishing sector. Thank you. Thank you very much, Madam. And as we look at the next partner in the terms of an international organization that has been working closely with the FAO, I will now direct this question to Mr. Frederick Hag given that IMO is in partnership with FAO in the Glow Litter project. Um, from your experience, would you briefly describe the role that IMO plays in ocean governance from the perspective of marine plastic litter in particular? Thank you. And I, I think um, Amparo uh, and also Dr. Mathekel before uh, described it quite well. But I think one thing I would like to perhaps highlight is that um, Although IMO is the, um, the regulatory body focusing on, and on establishing the framework for shipping, international shipping, uh, it has a, a, a clear mandate there, and as well the prevention of pollution from dumping at waste at sea. All of these aspects interface with almost all other maritime issues as well. Uh, so what we do uh, in IMO clearly has an impact on all the the ocean-related uh, aspect. So that's why what I mentioned before, uh, we really see the importance of um, understanding that whatever problems we have, they, we may have solutions within our sectors, but to truly make a difference, we need to bridge across and work with, for example, FAO, uh, as we're doing in this project because um, many of the solutions are not just within one sector, they are uh, spanning several of them. Uh, and that's what we, when we created this project, uh, which in 2019 came about uh, as an idea of the late Joanna Toole, who unfortunately lost her life in the, the, uh, on her way to UNEA in 2019. The, the idea was to really start to do that, and that's why we established the project with a project coordination unit that spans two organizations, which is a first for IMO and quite uh, groundbreaking for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hug, for that highlight. And um, I take note that uh, Mr. Steve, Mr. Stig Travik from NORAD has given us some insight on the role that NORAD plays. However, we are keen, and this is the question that I kindly direct to you, what, what can we put into consideration in 2022 
while still considering that um, there are tons of plastic pollution entering our oceans? Well, uh, I think the, the, the previous speakers touched upon it, yeah, that stronger partnerships are, are needed to, to really uh, tackle uh, the problem. I'd like to, to commend uh, IMO and uh, FAO for, uh, within the Global Litter Programme, launching the uh, Global Industry Alliance. So to pull really industry into uh, to this work is very important. I think also our friends from civil society have a very important role to to play uh, here. I mean, there are, there are still a m number of places where single-use plastics is used, where recyclable plastics could have been used. Why? Be because the industry think still thinks that a nicer-looking bottle gives you a uh, competitive advantage. So you might be able to take that advantage uh, away uh, from them. But I think in, in, in general, it's about creating the uh, alliances, it's about creating the economic opportunities, as the minister uh, pointed to, and it, it's about doing it in a, in a way that includes also the people who work in the waste sector. I think that is a very important point that we should really focus on, how to create better jobs in the whole value chain around the uh, waste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And now I have a next question for Mr. Gustav from the Worldwide Fund for Nature in Sweden. After what he has highlighted of his role in this particular panel, my question to you is, what could be the role of the legally binding treaty on plastic pollution as an instrument of international law looking at the implementation of SDG 14 that is closely related to these titles of the side event? Thank you. Why are they looking so nervously at me? <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> now, I will say we were very happy that the United Nations Environment Assembly in March decided to start negotiations on a legally binding uh, treaty on plastic pollution. I think this was a fantastic achievement, but obviously it was not a coincidence. Uh, we have friends here, different states, but so from civil society, we had an amazing campaign where WWF was one of the leads. We had support by more than two million persons, 40 financial institutions, 80 companies, and more than 1,000 groups and organizations around the world. So it's amazing when sort of civil society can stand up uh, together. And you might think this is the time to you know, pop the champagne, lean back, uh, enjoy uh, the success. But I think really now we need to focus because the real work starts now. We need to go into the detail now in the negotiations because we know that sort of big oil or big plastic, big chemical, we do the opposite. So now we have to get this right. So, so the answer to your question is really, it depends. Because the SDG is like a visionary, what you say, future, a sustainable future we must work to. When with the treaty that is right, we might reach it. Uh, but only if it's done right, and that will now be hammered out the coming two years, five negotiations, rounds, and one diplomatic conference uh, at least. So we think the Junia resolution, it is a great start, really. It outlines uh, the development of a robust treaty, uh, and it allows global rules along the full life circle of plastic. And it also represents the beginning of collaborative work, so you can bring together all stakeholders in the value chain uh, so we can together can address uh, plastic pollution. But devil is in the details here. So we think it's important that the new treaty must, must go much further than just creating aspirational goals and then letting, putting the entire burden on states to implement it themselves. But what must happen now is that we must agree on common global bans and phase-outs of harmful and excessive uh, plastic products and materials. And we must also have product design requirements that ensures reuse, recycling, and facilitates collection. So if it is designed this way, the answer is definitely yes. Uh, we will be able to implement SDG 14 and also SDG 
12 on sustainable consumption. So we have a friendly government here. We urge you, but we very much urge the rest of the world to keep up the momentum. Uh, that's been so great this spring from WWF point of view. We will definitely keep our momentum uh, and work with this intensely uh, the coming years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much on the highlight to keep the momentum. Closely related to what Mr. Gustav has mentioned, I have a question for Principal Secretary, Madam Nancy. How can the legally binding treaty support the marine environment? in relation to SDG 14, the role it can play. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Oh, you can hear me, sorry, sorry. I think um, just further from what my previous co-panelists have said, I think it will help bring uniformity, international cooperation, uh, you know, a measure in which we can judge our actions, uh, legally binding like, regulations, research and also encourage uh, more money into research because we are aware that uh, the, the, the oceans, we know how much value they have for us, but that has not been commensurate with the amount of investments we have been ready to commit in terms of getting to know more and, and getting research into that area. I think that would bring uh, I mean, uh, a legally in binding instrument in terms of uh, technical cooperation because of collaboration would really help. Capacity building as well. And, and these are all good for the implementation of SDG 14. Thank you very much, Madam Principal Secretary. As well as closely related to what we have been discussing, I have a question for Honorable Minister, Mr. Gustavo. I take note that Ecuador played an active role during the recently concluded working group meeting in Dakar, Senegal, with regard to the consideration to have Ecuador also participate in the working of the Intergovernmental Negotiating Committee to develop a newly legally binding instrument on plastic pollution. And to you, my question is, what do you think will be required to ensure that the outcome of the process leading to the treaty will eventually be adopted and implemented by the states? And will this affect the significant aspects of policy and practices globally to end plastic pollution? Thank you. Um, I consider myself a pathological, opt optimistic person. So I, I will not say in the question that eventually it will be implemented. I will say that it will be implemented um, for Ecuador that um, we have continental coast and we have oceanic coast. Uh, it, it is a matter of survival to find the solution, to find the way that this will be implemented. You all know Galapagos, um, and I already shared with you all the efforts we have been making with institutions as WWF and among other international allies. So we are really trying to keep Ecuador clean out of plastic. But I want to share three numbers, or a couple numbers. Um, even though I told you the circular economy law, the single-use plastic law, the municipality decrees, um, the redeemable tax, even though we do all those efforts, we collect from Galapagos Coast, which I hope you feel it as yours as we feel it. It's a worldwide natural heritage. Uh, we collect 83% of plastic from other continents in Galapagos Coast. And 16% of the plastic we collect, it comes from the Ecuadorian coast, continental coast and 1% from the local, uh, from, from Galapagos. So it, it doesn't matter the effort we make internally. It is a local problem that the only way to solve it is international. It's here. The only thing is that the first income that the country has, the number one, it's shrimp farms. And number two, we're the biggest fishing fleet in the Pacific East. Between those two sectors, we reach 
about $8 billion of income. That's a lot for us. So it's a matter of surviving. We're going to fight uh, in, in terms of uh, doing all of our, our effort, but, but because it's not just of, of keeping clean this, the, the sea. It's, it's a matter of surviving for us. So uh, um, I think what I said, the, the challenge is to balance all the different things we have in terms of, uh, of economy, population, technology, uh, control. You know, um, even though we have all these regulations, we have some weakness, uh, not, not weakness, um, debilidades. Witnesses, no, that's right. Witness, thank you. <laughs> uh, so a lot of control we need because it, it, it is very difficult to technology, among other things. So I think we should keep that uh, on mind and we have to be very practical, practical to, to, to control this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. I still note that we have Madam Maria with us virtually, and so that we can bring her back into the podium virtually. I will definitely be curious to know what is the key advice that you can offer with regard to the transboundary and cross-sectional nature of the subject matter related to plastic pollution. And right after Maria answers the question, we shall open up the plenary for some questions. Welcome. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, so exactly because marine plastic litter is a transboundary and cross-sectoral issue for its nature, uh, I believe that the key is uh, in creating these uh, partnerships that we are uh, discussing and, 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 and all the panelists have mentioned during their interventions. Uh, so th this is, th that is why significant efforts have to be put in coordinating the different public, but also private actors, uh, civil society, of course, and also at the different regional uh, geographical scales. So from the local scale inside the country at the national level, but also uh, at a regional and, and global level, as um, uh, Mr. Gustavo Manrique mentioned, uh, they find, uh, despite of the national laws they have implemented in Ecuador, they, they continue funding plastic litter in their cost. So that is why it is important that the issue is addressed uh, at, at different also geographical levels. And th that is what we are doing through the Glow Litter Partnerships Project, which is creating this uh, regional but also global um, partnerships between different countries, but also by engaging the private sector and the civil society. I, I didn't mention before that we have also the possibility to, uh, to engage other uh, organizations like civil society organizations through what we call strategic partners. We have, uh, currently we have different strategic partners uh, engaged in, the, uh, in our project. Just to mention some of them, one is uh, UNEP and GRID Arendal, uh, the Global Ghost Gear Initiative, and also, of course, UN Global Compact, which is uh, providing the, the Secretariat services for the uh, Global Industry Alliance. So I think that's, that's the, the, the key, my, my key advice. Thank you very much, Maria, for the advice. I open up the floor for the plenary questions. Yes, sir. <coughs> A microphone will be brought to you. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for being dressed so, but I don't have suit because my hand is broken and it's very cold. My question would be about cross-border cooperations, if you have any experience with pollution uh, around your country, 
uh, which came from a different country to a river and then adds into the ocean. And if um, the United Nations has a dedicated program to solve or support countries uh, to solve that. Um, and may you allow me, why I'm asking this, I'm from Hungary and I'm the youth delegate of my country and I'm working on that, um, that solving the waste management of some schools in Ukraine in the Zakarpatian region where the Tisza River came from and has a big pollution. And I want to hear if you have any good practices uh, to that topic. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I give this question to Honorable Minister Gustav. Uh, yes, um, I would like to share that uh, actually from, from uh, UK it came um, uh, technology named Ictyon um, from a person which is half uh, from UK, from, has from Ecuador, and it won the most advanced in technology to clean uh, plastic from ocean or rivers. The name is Ictyon, and uh, from what I was reading, I'm not sure about this, that 80% uh, uh, of the plastic pollution that it's in the ocean comes from continent, you know, that, that it's pulled from, from rivers. And, and they are trying to develop this machine. And most of the plastic that, it, that are on the river comes from 10 rivers. So the, the Pareto theory, we have to work on that. But at the end, I will, in the closing remarks, I will share my, my thoughts about that. But, but that's the technology I know that exists. There are some others. Maybe we can share. I have his contact. I can share it to you later on. Thank you very much. We have a question at the front or from the lady. Yes, madam. Yes. Uh, my name is Ulrika Franke, and I'm the president of ISO, the International Standardization Organization, which I think you've heard of. And we have a lot of standards actually addressing your problem that has been created by all the different stakeholders, government, politicians, business, and scientists. And I would just reach out to you and use us. Use the standardization system. It's international. Businesses are used to work with us and to have that when they tender for different projects or whatever. So please, use the international system because that will speed up things if you can connect it with your regulations and what you're putting forward in the United Nations. So please, use us. Great. Thank you very much for that um, consideration for stakeholder engagement. We have our last, our last two questions, one at the front and one at the back before the closing remarks. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm a youth representative from the Netherlands. Uh, and with, I've heard that with plastic bottles we've said there are auto, auto, sorry, alternatives, right? So we are going to ban them, we're going to tax them, uh, same for the plastics. Um, but most of the plastic in the ocean is actually from fishing gear. So why are we not banning fishing or taxing fish products? Because that would be a very uh, a logical solution to have. And of course, some local communities very much depend on fishing. I, I get that. But most countries could and should, uh, I think, fix, uh, sorry, tax or ban fish. Um, because there are alternatives for that as well. We can eat plants. We can eat algae. So why are not, we not talking about this? Thank you very much for that question. Mr. Gustav Lind, do you have a reply for this? <laughs> we talk <laughs> extremely much about fishing and, and sustainable fishing. Uh, and, and obviously, the nets, uh, it's a part of that and sort of how to make it better. There is this excessive amount of harmful subsidies to the fishing industry that goes in the wrong direction, sort of keeps this system afloat while the fishing are, fishes are disappearing uh, rapidly and the fishing nets are polluting uh, by plastics uh, everywhere. So I think it's high on our agenda, uh, and we will continue to sort of uh, work for that uh, strongly. Thank you very much. We have a last question at the back. So we all know that plastic is everywhere, and that is increasing more and more as we speak. I'm encouraged by what I've seen and heard here in this, uh, in this forum and, and in these meetings. But as someone who's been involved in the Plastic Pollution Treaty process for many years and someone who just came back from Senegal, there's still resistance to doing the right thing and to putting people and planet before profit. 
what can we do to ensure that what we've said here and what we've all embraced here truly comes across in the paper and in the negotiations so that we get the treaty language that we need to. Thank you very much. I can direct this to Mr. Frederick from IMO, who deals with the oh. regulatory aspect. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right person to answer that question at all, actually. It might be someone who's better placed. Uh, but I, 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 I take your point. And I, as IMO is also following the process, of course, as one of the many stakeholders. Uh, and what we, um, what we, what we so far have, have been uh, thinking about is that there, there is also some existing frameworks to build on um, and, and to strengthen those as well, at the same time as we raise the ambition levels and, and, and innovate and, and, and look forward in a, in a, in a, in a different manner. Uh, but for, for us, for example, we have a framework that has been existing for 30 years, but we still need to do more to make sure to raise the bar so everyone can implement it. So I think we need to keep that in mind at the same time as we we go forward with the new treaty. But on the other aspects of the treaty, I think there might be others on the panel who are more uh, better placed to, to, to answer that, perhaps. Thank you very much. Any comment from the other panelists? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I can also not solve the, the problem. But I, but I think in order to zoom out a little bit, which I feel is what, what you're doing, uh, of course, sustainable management of the oceans as, as a whole is what we, we're talking about. And this is, at least for our part, why Norway is very uh, determined to continue supporting the, the high-level uh, panel on the oceans, which has as a goal to have 100% sustainably managed oceans by 2030. So that, that's one, one area. And I think, I mean, in order to really tackle the plastic problem, it's about how we produce, how we consume, what we buy. I mean, it, it touches on everything, yeah? So it's, uh, I agree, it's a, big, it's a big issue beyond what we're talking about uh, here today. Thank you very much. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of our panel session. However, before we finish, I give each panelist two seconds to give us a parting shot. <laughs> Kindly. <laughs> to give us a parting shot. We can start with Madam Nancy, the PS. I think it's all been said, we have a problem. We need, it's cross-sectoral, it's got many factions. We need to get our act together and deal with it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Minister, welcome. Yeah, I, I'm doing the closing remarks, right? Yes, you are, sir. So I don't want to spoil, <laughs> spoiler my intervention, but uh, we need to work in culture, that I will go deep on that later. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I think I will, will stress the, the point of, of building capacity in all areas, parts of the world and, and uh, between sectors and work together more closely. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the momentum, uh, keep up the pressure on the negotiations uh, and focus on a real result, not just some blah, blah, blah result. Thank you. Yeah. I'll, I'll maybe add one point that we didn't really talk about, but I, I think innovation and really getting more investment into uh, to young people who want to create a different kind of ocean economy is an area we also need to focus on. Thank you very much. Honorable participants, I would like us to give a round of applause to all the panelists who have, <laughs> as they leave the floor, you can have your seats. The panelists, you can now have your seats as we move to the closing remarks. Thank you. And on this note, on this note, I welcome Honorable Mr. Gustav Miranda, Minister of Environment, Water and Ecological Transition, Republic of Ecuador, to give us the closing remarks on this side event that has been titled Action Towards Plastic Pollution for Implementation of SDG 14. Welcome, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. Um, I want to share the closing, closing remarks from my point of view. I don't want to overview what we all mentioned. I want to take advantage of this opportunity 
to share my thoughts, my perception of what is happening. Uh, by the way, I want to thank you for first moderating this such uh, well and mentioning that uh, Ecuador is part of the INC, of the Bureau. That's an honor for us and let you know that uh, we're trying to become now the um, chairman, not us, not me, Luis Vallas, the vice chancellor of Ecuador, to become the, uh, the, the, the chairman of the INC. So we would love to have, we would love to have your support. As I told you, our, what it's moving us, it's a matter of survival. And uh, survival is the, the first thing that humans move in order to make changes. So I beg you to bet on us to lead that. I have the perception that all the conversations around plastic pollution are trying to find, are trying to finding the solution at the end of the value of chain. I think that we're trying to work in technology, in recycling, in lowering the density, and trying to not leave, leave no one behind. That's a very complicated thing. Engineers talk or said or believe that typically the solutions for the problems are in the initial of the value of chain. And I think that we're trying to talk about the end of the value of chain. Mahatma Gandhi had a phrase that says, if you want to measure the intelligence of a population, see how they treat their animals. I believe that if Mahatma Gandhi was alive, he should say, if you want to see the intelligence of a population, see how many garbage they have in their trash cans. So we need to consume less. And if that will leave someone behind, that's OK. But we're not leaving future generation behind. Corporates will find a way to adapt. But we need to work in young generations to teach them that they must not consume single use. Listen that I didn't use plastic. Single use. We're using, even though it's wood, a thing to mix the coffee, eight seconds. Five seconds to mix the coffee, even though it's wood. And then they throw it. And there is a whole system based on taxes that we have to pay to mix the coffee. Wood or plastic. So I think we truly have to change the culture of us of consuming single use. Whatever you see in this room comes from nature. The curtains, the podium, this tie, my glasses, everything. When I was born, we were 300.5 billion. And now we're going to reach 8 billion. 8 billion in clothes, in ties, in glasses, in food, housing. So we need to reduce the pressure. And we need to change the way of measuring success. So you are more success in sense the more you consume. So fast you can change the car, or watches, clocks, or your phone. I'm five generations behind. And not, I'm not a less efficient than you. I have WhatsApp. I can do streaming. I can call. I can see Netflix, five generations. This is Colton, this is aluminum, this is gold. But, I, but I, don't, I hope you don't measure me if I have the last generation of a phone. So I truly believe that the solution is in the beginning of the chain. We need to change the culture. We need to change to work in the youth. We need to change to, to let them know that they are not more successful by having more. They are more successful of being more, being more, more human. <clears throat> In that sense, I want to share a last experience that uh, we just signed with FAO, F -A -O, to do uh, an experiment in Galapagos. Um, 
you know, the traffic light. In Ecuador, we have traffic light for food. If you, anything you want to buy in a supermarket, in the back, there is a traffic light, obvious yellow, uh, red, yellow, and green. And we measure sodium, fat, and sugar. And we change, it's a law, and we change the culture. I have three kids, and they look at the behind. And they choose because of the health of them. So I believe, but that, and in the United States, there is a national law that you measure before eating. They, 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 in the menu, they have to tell you the calories. B why? Because it was too expensive for US government to control or to combat human health, obesity, among others. But everything, all those national regulations and, and change of behaving, it, they are focused in controlling human health. But what about planet health? So I want to get to your point, Mr. President of um, ISO, ISO. We should have some certification or standards to measure planet health. And as the traffic light, we should work in a protocol that, OK, human health, the traffic light, sodium, fat, sugar. But we should have four plastic. If you are going to buy a shampoo or whatever, we should have an index of three things combined in one number. It should be very simple. How much of that product was recycled? How much of that product could be recycled? And the calority capacity. One number, 85%. And the other one, it's 92. I picked the 92 because I'm, I'm worried about the planet health, not just as the human health. So I encourage all the people that it's working, that it will be working on the 3D and, and the other, oh, we all are, to find practical ways. We have a big difference between the Paris Agreement and the Nairobi Agreement, the UNEA. The Paris Agreement is a, li a little bit uh, um, e Ethereum. You know, we're talking about 1.5 degrees. So, but, but today, it raised three more. It didn't happen anything. And, and no, it's not 1.5, it's two. In plastic, it's very pragmatical. You see the plastic. You, you, you cut the stomach of a fish, you will find the plastic there. It's very pragmatical. So we need to find practical solutions in order to apply for future generations. So uh, once again, thanks for g giving the opportunity to echo to share our, um, um, I'm, I know I'm running out of time now and I didn't share the experience about Galapagos. If you want to know, I will share it later on. Uh, but we're measuring the carbon footprints of food that it sells in Galapagos. I mean, it's a saying to consume a salmon from Canada or Chile, which is beautiful and delicious, being in Galapagos. You have to consume local food so the money will go to local communities and you have a lower footprint. But it's a matter, again, of money and survival. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, for that remarkable and comprehensive closing remarks. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of this side event that is again titled, as per the share on the screen, Action Towards Marine Plastic Litter, Pollution for Implementation of SDG, SDG 14. I want to thank all our supporting partners. That has been the Republic of Kenya, Republic of Ecuador, the International Maritime Organization, Worldwide Fund for Nature, MTCC Africa, and NORAD as well, as well as the FAO. Thank you very much to our participants. Have a good evening and have a safe evening as well. Thank you.